Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending where you are from. Welcome to the panel discussion, STEM education across the APRU network, shaping learning experiences for students. My name is Elaine Hung, Events and Relations Manager of APRU, and I'm the host of today's webinar. First of all, I would like to briefly introduce about APRU, especially for those who join APRU events for the first time. Next slide, please. APRU is, an, APRU is a network of 56 leading universities from Australia, Asia, North and South America. And being the voice of knowledge and innovations of the Asia Pacific region, we bring together thought leaders, researchers, policymakers to exchange ideas and to collaborate on effective solutions to the challenges of the 21st century of Asia Pacific and even to the world. And we have a number of research programs and also very exciting initiatives for all members of the university. I would encourage you to visit our website, apru.org, to learn more about our work and also to subscribe to our newsletters to stay tuned on our upcoming events. Now, let me introduce our moderator of today's panel discussion. Today's moderator is Eleanor Vandergrift, or usually I would affectionately call her Ellie. Ali is the Program Director for Global Science Education Initiatives at the University of Oregon. She has been a biology teacher for 18 years and has led science education professional development for more than a decade. And she has facilitated STEM education and communication workshops at the University of Oregon and also with partners university around the world. So without further ado, I will hand the time over to Ali. Ali, over to you, please. Great, thank you, Elaine. So glad that so many of you are joining us today for this panel discussion about STEM education across our APRU network. In this panel, we're going to hear from faculty across the APRU network who teach in STEM, technology, engineering, and math, STEM fields. And I'll ask the panel members questions that explore the intersection of creating a student-centered learning environments, our diverse cultural settings, and our experiences transitioning to online and remote learning while still keeping students at the center of our work. I'm going to interview, or I'm sorry, introduce the members of the panel. And then we have a series of four questions and we'll rotate through and the panel members will answer those questions for you. Our first member is Tamara Freeman, who is an associate professor in the Department of Chemistry at the University of British Columbia where she teaches the introductory lecture and labs for chemistry classes. Yasuhiro Suzuki is an associate professor in the Department of Complex Systems Science in the School of Informatics at Nagoya University. He's also chairman of the Special Interest Group on Natural Computing and the Japanese Society of Artificial Intelligence. Robert Thompson is an associate professor in the Department of Biology located in the School of Life Sciences at the University of Hawaii in Manoa. And Tim Wu is an associate professor of engineering education in the Department of Electronic and Computer Engineering at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. He's also the founding director for the Center for Global and Community Engagement in the School of Engineering. Can we have the next slide, please, with the first question? Oh, and the session goals. The goals for this session are that we are going to learn from these faculty about the ways that they are teaching with student-centered teaching methodologies. Our panelists will reflect on how their teaching varies across cultural and national boundaries. We're going to give the panelists an opportunity to think about and you to think about the benefits of for improved science education that are only accessible when we apply the model of multiple societies across diverse cultural settings. And we'll hear practical approaches from each of these STEM faculty members that they've used across the network to support their diverse student populations across the entire Pacific Rim during this time of upheaval and transformation of our traditional academic environments. So the first question, and we're going to start with Tamara, is how do you dis engage students as active participants in your learning? And I'm going to ask you a longer version of this question. 
which is please describe how you engage students as active participants and how do students respond to the student-centered classroom environment. And for each panelist, as a reminder, we have three minutes for each of you for each question. So thank you, Ellie. Um, I guess the, the best way for me to describe how we approach this um, active learning in our classroom is what you can see here in this slide is we have a brand new building on our campus called the Commons. And the big lecture hall that you can see here is the Commons 201. It was built specifically with active learning in mind. So because I'm a large class, I get to sit in this or teach. You can maybe see right at the front of that classroom that's a 400 person capacity classroom. So my first year students, that's a picture of my students as well in the little inset, um, doing one of our active learning activities. But what's beautiful about this classroom and the way we get the students engaged in the material is that um, every platform on here has two tables at equal height. So the students can actually physically turn around. So you'll see in that insight, one of the students there has his back to the camera because his seat is at the exact same platform level and he can just swivel around in his chair and we can form these groups. So um, I'd like to believe, and actually it's, it's true, we've been doing some, um, some investigations and some student feedback. They are loving the active learning components that we implement into the classroom. They're responding with the fact that they, they feel like they learn more, that they're engaged more, they're allowed to talk in class, so it's not just behind the professor's back. Um, so what we're seeing is that with 50% of my classroom in this active learning, increasing discussion uh, capacity, that the students are actually doing better in the classroom. And I'll, I'll talk about that again a little bit later. But I wanted to mention um, one of the beautiful things that we found, my colleague and I, for doing this active learning in this flipped classroom module and this it blended learning before um, the online transition, is that the transition to online for the students that are used to this was a lot smoother um, of a transition than we noticed for students who are coming in brand new for the semester. So a lot of really, um, a, lot of, a lot of really positive feedback from our students. And um, if you could be in the classroom when they're there and even online, the chatting that goes on the chat function between the students asking each other questions is, is really inspiring. So I think, I think I'll leave it there for answering Question one. Thank you. And you just mentioned the chat feature, which made me remember if, if as we're going through, if you have questions, please use the Q&A button at the at the bottom of your screen and we'll have time at the end of our session for some of the questions that come in. Yasuhiro, could you tell us about your experience? Yes. Um, now, uh, this year I met sudden uh, kind of challenge I have to take. Um, so uh it's not easy so and i think it is kind of good challenge for me so uh, my purpose and my try is i'd like to free from pc because students have to in front of pc all day long so i don't i didn't want to just tie it to a pc so i wrote online textbook and they don't have to uh sit uh, in front of PC for a long time. And I have uh, uh, four lectures. One is an uh, information literacy for freshmen. And, uh, uh, but these freshmen are not science uh, department, department of science. They from economics and uh, literature and another uh, history or something. So I also teach uh, numerical analysis for graduate, graduate school and uh, natural computing. So, uh, I, my policy was, I ask the freshman be a journalist. I give, I gave a basic skills of data sciences and a basic skill to be on data journalism. And I do, uh, I ask the student, please find out the universe of uh, internet, find out a very interesting story and correct the story and evaluate. And if it needed, please use a uh, data science skills. And uh, everyone uh, create kind of uh, article, like a newspaper, like. So that was uh, my final uh, kind of uh, evaluation uh, I used. And also uh, in medical analysis and natural computing, I treated 
a student, not just a student. I treated to be an independent scientist. So I gave all needed tools. So I do, I did ask student, please explore in the universe of science and do science by your own. So um, I think uh, they are really, really motivated uh, more than expected. They are free from uh, classroom work and group work. They are independent scientists and they are independent journalists. They show high creativity and high performances. So for me, uh, it is kind of good uh, uh, experiences and I do hope in this direction uh, on uh, online learning. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Bob, Bob, can you tell us about your experience? And I know you don't have a slide, so we'll, we'll listen to you without a slide. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so uh, we've been doing a, a range of things here in Hawaii um, related to this. I'd, I'd say like my, my own personal focus on it is, has really been to try to focus on um, sort of breaking down this, this lecturer versus student uh, dichotomy that the students are, are very used to. We sort of train them to do. Um, so, so we do that a lot of ways. Um, one is uh, like Tamara was, was mentioning um, newly designed classrooms that are sort of custom built for um, these sort of active learning types of activities. So on our campus, those range from um, like custom built uh, studios where we have um, tables for all the students that they all kind of sit around and face one another. Every table has a big monitor and an Apple TV, so they can sort of easily connect up with whatever de devices they have, share, um, share whatever we're talking about, you know, make their own little presentations, give them at their tables. Um, so that's kind of like the, you know, the full custom classroom meant for active learning. Um, but we're also doing a lot where we're, we're redesigning sort of standard classrooms in, in simple, less expensive ways to make this easy. So really just like moving to, um, to individual student desks that are all on wheels and we come into the classroom and everybody can group up um, according to the needs of, of that class. Um, so that, that's been one real activity. Um, and the way we try to make use of those classes is again, try to, trying to get away from um, a lecturing mindset and, and present the material in more of a problem-based way that the students actually engage with. And um, we find that if you kind of keep that up, sort of keep pushing interesting problems to students, getting them to discuss with one another. Eventually this kind of dichotomy between the, the instructor, the lecturer and, and the learners um, does start breaking down and eventually it becomes a thing where everybody's just kind of um, focused on the topic of the day and we're all teaching it to one another. Great, thank you, Bob. Tim, and I know you have a slide, so we'll have that slide. Yeah. So thank you, thank you for and uh, and and invite us to, to invite me to share my experience from from the, about the STEM education. That's similar to the speakers before. They also mentioned one thing is about the peer group discussions and the group, the small group active learning from that one. So the course I teach one of uh, the course I teach is you can see from the and from this a lot from the left hand side the students have to build their own projects based on the our uh, basic knowledge. So how can we help them? To, to build the projects. Mainly the one thing I think is very important that we have to find some inspiring story for them. So uh, now how can we the engineer, an engineer is not only um, build some elegant toys and not only the talking about research well, not only talking about uh, and some high technology. Sometimes appropriate technology can help the people. So uh, one thing that I would like to inspire them to think more outside the box, we will like, I would always show them some inspiring story. So the student give a very good feedback that uh, they in the course, in the course we encourage the engineers to care for community because if there are a lot of needies around the world. If we can help them um, for the for, for the public being really really helpful. So based on this one, after the inspiring story during that, we also have the peer discussion from the project proposal, because that usually when the student try to propose their project, they always think that their project is the excellent one, but but assumption that there's a lot of constraint. But meanwhile, when they sit in the listener, they always have a lot of inquiry and queries about their work. So making them to sit together and also become the active listener and also active presenter is a very important. 
try to listen to other people. How can you present your work in the layman term? Maybe you can use in professional term, it's also be fine. But at least this is a dialogue, let them to do that. And the other one, and the other things are, how can we help the student to do more interaction? We use some online tools and to do some in-class Q&A section. Uh, we are not looking for the solution is a perfect one because some of the question is open end. For example, ask their opinions about um, right now we have uh, our activities. Uh, you may pick up one of the choice, but either no matter which choice they choose, they also be correct because this is their opinions. So we are more, sometimes we are very straightforward for the answer, but some of them will be more opening and questions. So let them to interact their answers and also share uh, the, the statistics around the classroom, they can see how the classmates think about this one. One more thing about for the labs, when we try to design, we try to line up the laboratory experiments line by line and one by one, so make it to be connected because the connections will make them to know how can they learn the things will be more important because uh, we, we believe that no matter how you design, go through all the six forces, you can uh, be in work. Based on this uh, part uh, in the COVID-19 right now, what we have to do, even we turn this to the online, uh, all the discussion can be go through online. We just only did it yesterday. But for laboratory experiment, because we really encourage them to do more. So we do it, we, we borrow all the equipment for them. They can bring the equipment at home to do all the experiments and all the prepare all the lab in advance. And then the, in, uh, the very positive part is uh, even COVID-19 and online learning is a really, really challenging from this year. But the point is, in the class, we have a more interaction. Uh, and they raise a lot of questions using the chat. And at the same time, I invite my TAs, uh, uh, teaching assistant, sit in the class. And, and because we allow the student to send a private message to him, because sometimes the student don't want to voice out the message and cry all the time. So the, the, our TAs, are, I have two TAs at, the, at the time, they always mention that they're quite busy answering a lot of questions. So uh, and then the other part is, uh, and meanwhile, we also do something like the COVID-19, uh, we have a STEAM to the team. In, in this part, when we do something, when we provide the training for them in the face-to-face. -face. But unfortunately, uh, this one we target group is they try to learn the technologies and not the science knowledge and educate the youth. Because when they educate the youth, they can have to using the name and term in an appropriate way. This is also a skill set for training. But unfortunately, during the COVID-19, all the activities is canceled face-to-face. -face. Uh, we sit down with students, talk with them, how can we do help the, help the youth and help them to help our students to think outside the box. And finally, we sit down and discuss them for a few, few iterations. They think that, how about we do STEM at home video? Um, this is meaning that pick up the uh, any equipment at home and try to make use of become the STEM activities and also make use of science and engineering knowledge. So, so uh, those students try to learn how to edit in the video, everything's done by our UG students. So for that time, they learn become a YouTuber in some sense. So, so we, we think that uh, this is the part, how can we motivate them, work together, and we also get a lot of positive feedback. Uh, and because we really, um, and one thing is that even for those uh, students and the target participant, they may not be the, uh, only limited to, to the main school student. They may be SCN student, they may be FMRT under the age group because we really promote inclusion concept in our team. Great, thank you, Tim. Thank you. One commonality that I hear among all four of your stories, there's actually two commonalities that I had, uh, that I heard. One is around students engaging and working with each other and learning from each other. And the second big one is about the real world application and the designing and looking at experiments and looking at real interesting questions that keep the students engaged in the material. Those are the two common themes. And I, I loved the different ways that each of your institutions is approaching how do you create classroom environments where students can interact with each other. Do you have a very high tech space like Tim just described or Bob you described a much more low tech you just have wheels on the chairs and that can develop the interactivity. Okay, great. For the second question, um, here's the short version is how can you create inclusive environments, but Tim, I'm, here's the longer version, is that our institutions help students who are from diverse backgrounds and diverse experiences grow as members of a global community. 
how do you create an inclusive environment for students as part of, of their development as being part of the global community? And so Tim, three minutes, please. Oh, I think you're muted. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, uh, there let we me go, go first. Thank you. Yeah, okay, can you hear? Okay, let me go first. And for the diversity and also inclusive, we're always talking about the varieties. And for example, just like we have a robotics team, and mainly the people think about robotics is uh, how can you make the robot using the mechanical, electronics, and also programming. But to us, we think that's something outside the box. And uh, always as you are interested, you can join us. So our team have a student from engineering science school and also from, from the uh, and, and, uh, engineering science school and also from business school. So they learn from the ground. And in here, they also have the nationality in here. Now, one thing that the one key word in my slide is uh, in the, when we try to do this one, we are very important that we're talking about a very important culture. The culture is family. Uh, how can we work together? Now, for example, in the case, uh, and when we talk about family, it's meaning that someone may, be, uh, may, may not be happy, and may be sad, may be, may be uh, feel not doing good. The other people always to be support them. So family culture is a very, very important in our course value. So um, based on this one, we, we empower them to work together. And then besides our robotics competition, uh, maybe you can go to the second slide. Now, besides the competitions for that one, we just only use it as a starting point. Because that in most of the event, they think that a student joins the competition. After the competition, they can go on and then they just only focus on competition only. But but other way around, we use this one as a platform to attract the student. Entering student and most of our students in high school, they may not be uh, very uh, outgoing on that one. They focus on doing the work. But the point is that once they have no experience to do the prototype, they can go to other design competition, technical one, businesses, entrepreneurial one, because they have the prototyping technique. And the other one is very important that because we inspire them to do a lot of work and also let them to do some uh, inspiration to have a lot of initial projects. No matter if they are doing the hobbies, research work, and also they, a lot of them propose their own five-year projects because in engineering, we have to do the five-year project at the final year. Mostly, most of them will be, um, professor will list out a lot of the, for them to choice. But for us, uh, our students do a lot of things they would like to create and also build in this part. And, and another thing, follow the previous slide and previous uh, course, as I mentioned, we really would like to engage with community because if the engineer can engage with community, we call the engineer in community, they will know how to help the people. They will know that uh, uh, empathy, they can do more from that one. So that's the reason why we do from here. One more part, it's very important, we have a train the trainer program our senior members to become volunteers. Uh, no matter if you join the competition for next year or not, but we just only try to let them work together. So very important that in our side, we think one important message is family is a culture. Once we build up the family, everyone will work together. And also we think about that, we break all the, all the barriers, no matter uh, uh, and, and whether you are, you are in, the, in the engineering field or not, but you are all welcome to join the robotics competition. Majority of the student is from first year and second year. So, so just graduate from their high school. So they are still engaged with, recently they, are, they, they conduct a lot of activities and because we again, talk to them, talk to student, carry the message, the core values of family, they will work much more than we expected. Great. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Tamara, same question to you. How do you create an inclusive environment? And I believe you have a slide as well. I do. I think uh, the next, next slide, please. Next one, I think, is me. There we go. There we go. Yeah, so um, from day one of walking into my general chemistry classroom, um, you might notice that my classroom is quite different than some of the traditional chemistry courses that people have actually taken. And the approach that we take is we've got our entire course developed around a thematic framework of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So um, a big buzzword in chem education right now is this idea of systems thinking. So taking this idea that we're learning about this topic, but it actually interlocks and it creates uh, connections to a topic that's over here or a topic that's over here. And that's not traditionally the way that chemistry courses have been taught in at least my history and, and probably if you've taken a chemistry course, it's 
this topic and then this topic. So what we've done is to, to create these cogs that the students are supposed to be like putting together is the very first day of class, we give them this uh, Google doc document and the class logs on, they're told to bring their computers to the first day of class and they log on to this Google shared Google document. And throughout all of the UN sustainability principles, we ask them the question, how can chemistry be used to solve problems for the UN sustainability goals? And I think it speaks here to that to that global piece because everyone's got a dis different perspective of why they take chemistry and what good is chemistry to their life. But by the time we're done with this document, like you can see, I'm, I don't know if you can zoom in on your own computers or as you're watching, but like the number one uh, UN sustainability goal is no poverty. And the answers that the students give are, they're wonderful. Like we can, we can do this that creates more jobs and chemistry can help do this so that we have zero hunger. And one of my favorites that, you know, I initially wouldn't have had any idea what's chemistry got to do. There's uh, gender equality as one of the UN sustainability goals. And the students themselves are like free access to birth control and better drugs for, for transitioning and like, the students themselves, they're bringing in all their own life experiences. They're sharing it. The students are, are getting excited as they read one person's comment and they're, they're answering back. And it becomes this entire engaged idea in the classroom. And I profess to them as part of this, as part of this activity on the first day of class, I am not teaching this course to turn you all into chemists. I am teaching this course to you as, a, as if it might be your last chemistry course. And my goal here is to have you walk out as informed citizens, scientific citizens. So they can go on to a, a, a political career. They can go into any of the other STEM disciplines. Um, and I think that they, they take something from this activity that allows them to understand that it is a global community and that the STEM sciences, whether it's chemistry, science, or physics, math, biology, engineering, that they are technically connected and that they will work together to help their future goals. So I think that's my big <laughs> soapbox. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Yasuhiro. Yes, um, in uh, order to uh, develop an inclusive learning environment, I have been developing common language for uh, diverse backgrounds. Uh, one is science of and earth, one is uh, mathematics. Um, first of all, mathematics means uh, student, some students are very good at mathematics and some are not. So uh, my uh, common language is uh, based on elementary mathematics, just addition and subtraction. So anyone can access and anyone can create their own mathematical model. So, and but it based on uh, chemi uh, physical chemistry. Uh, in fact, it is a model of stochastic differential equation, a kind of uh, advanced mathematics. So anyone can access, so um, based on uh, their uh, knowledge levels. So uh, we can exchange ideas uh, among the student and my student and me. So we can uh, reproduce and uh, improve uh, models using a very com common easy languages. And another thing is science and, and uh, art, art. I am teaching in art school also, and I have been developed a language of tactile sense. It's called tactile score. Uh, it can describe tactile sense and uh, sensibilities. So an art school student had a qualitative ideas, something like image. So they can transform their image into a quantity, quantitative things by using a tactile score. And the peop, uh, student in science uh, can exchange, uh, can transform qualitative things into an uh, at work or kind of scientific uh, visualization things. And also from tactile score, we can, we can obtain uh, tactile sense. So we can communicate with people who uh, have disabilities. So uh, I, uh, in distant running, I um, communicate with some people who have deaf brain, cannot see and cannot hear. So uh, based on tactile score, we exchange ideas um, 
uh, through one kind of tactile sense. So uh, by using this uh, tactile score, uh, we can develop um, not only um, uh, people without disabilities, people with dis uh, disabilities. So that is uh, my inclusive learning environment challenge. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Bob. Yeah, um, so one of the things that um, I've, I've sort of really chosen to invest some time in over the last several years um, is actually trying to um, train more people at the university in, um, in, in, in sort of modern approaches to pedagogy that take advantage of active learning. Um, like, like many institutions, our undergraduates come in and um, a lot of their first contact with instructors is, is really with graduate students, with teaching assistants. Um, and I know like early on in, in my job here um, as a faculty member, uh, I had a few key experiences with teaching assistants coming in, um, having, let's just say, um, misconceptions, some, some classic misconceptions that we see crop up in STEM. Um, and just sort of realizing that we need to do more to um, really make the, to really teach the graduate students to teach better, right? So um, we of course do our, our TA trainings um, here at, at Hawaii, but um, what we've started doing is, is me and one other faculty member have started offering a graduate seminar periodically. So we do this um, roughly every other spring for, for the last six, eight years now. Um, where we actually delve into the academic literature on active learning and modern pedagogical approaches um, and see that data for ourselves, talk about, talk it through as scientists, um, you know, criticize study designs when that's appropriate and, and really think through how we know what we know about how to teach. Um, so that's been sort of a, a nice way to extend the, the impact of these approaches on, on my campus anyway. Um, Honestly, we started that effort as a, a way to just read more of this literature ourselves. It's basically an excuse to, to teach ourselves more. Um, but, but we very quickly realized the, the graduate students want more training along these lines. And really, um, my colleagues across the university often do too. So um, I, we're currently running this, this seminar. Um, it's a lot of fun to do. This is the fourth iteration. Um, so we probably trained uh, I, would, I would guess probably 65 graduate students at this point. Most of our, our newly hired faculty, most of our junior faculty have participated in the course. Um, we even got an associate dean to participate at one point, which felt like a real win. Um, so, so yeah, that's a place that we've focused a, a lot of real effort to try to um, get everyone kind of on the same team here and, and utilizing these similar approaches. Great. Thank you, Bob. I think that what you just said summarized really nicely what the other three had said in terms of using the best practices for thinking about inclusive education and again, making the content really relevant to the students so they can see the real world application and Tim you used the word empathy and Tamara that that was in your description too. And and then Bob, you're saying, we got to get everybody doing this. So it can't just be the four of us or the five of us who know this, this literature and this pedagogy, but how do we create entire universities where this is the norm? Great, great, thank you. Uh, question number three, here's the short version, Bob, I'm going to read the longer version to you. What benefits have your STEM students, and I think you just talked about your graduate STEM students, but I was thinking about undergrads. You can talk about either one, but what benefits have your STEM students experienced by engaging in a learning environment where engagement and inclusion are core elements? And then related to that, what are some lessons that you would like to share across our network? Yeah, so um, I, like I was saying earlier on, um, one of the, the goals in these classrooms is, is really to try to break down this, um, this kind of wall between the instructor and the students. And if, you, if you're sort of persistent at it and work at it long enough, as we all know, like you can get students to do that. Um, and it's really gratifying to see when that actually works. It's uh, really fun to see undergraduates that you know, like early in their career would, uh, were, were sort of very comfortable sitting passively um, uh, just sort of watching lectures and regurgitating on, on an exam to, to really sort of taking ownership for their own education um, 
really taking ownership for their their peers education as well like it becomes these little working groups where um it's not like oh this is confusing it's like let's all work together on this and and get through it together so um essentially it boils down to a, a greater degree of independence in the undergraduates uh which, which i think is is really what we're trying to to do if we're trying to um train a scientifically informed public um we really want the students independently engaging with these issues that are you know, of, of hugely important in, in the modern world um, and, and really taking that ownership. So um, I, I think that's the main benefit is the, the students seem to engage more uh, deeply with the material, but are, are just more open to the material. They're more engaged in, a, um, in STEM issues in the world at large. Do you have any lessons that you'd like to share that you think are applicable in, at other institutions? So um, I maybe get some more into this in the, the answer to the next question, but um, really I, I think right now is a time where uh, I'm certainly learning a lot as, as we've made this shift into online teaching modes. Um, so I, I happened to be on sabbatical last spring semester when the pandemic started. So I sort of missed the great unplanned switch to online instruction, um, but I'm catching up now. Um, and it's, it's been interesting to see how uh, some of these particular approaches we use in the classroom, like either translate pretty well to online instruction or don't. Um, so I'll, I'll talk in some more detail about that maybe in my answer to the next question. Great, thank you, Bob. Tim, and I know that you wanted to go back to, we want to go back a slide, I think, for Tim. Yes, uh, here is one. Uh, and, uh, before, because I talk about student part, I have to give you some idea. Yeah, this one, and uh, next one, next one, yeah. This is uh, what we are doing. Uh, just like what we mentioned, we would like to do engineering community. So what we do is uh, we think that we are strong in the robotics, especially underwater robotics. So why don't we try to build a platform for the youth and also the kids? The part is that when we talk about inclusion, we know that about the just invites inspired by uh, uh, a few years ago, we do a project for the hearing impaired and uh, visually impaired students. They can drive and build their underwater robot and then join the competition. They got the first one out in the among the same entire team competitive with the, with the uh, main school student. So when we come back the idea in here, we try to work out the part, make use of our knowledge work with the other non engineering students, other sister university, they are volunteers, they come to here, we teach them how to build the robots. At the same time, they teach us how can we work with the, the knowledge from the talking to SEN student, because when you talk to a uh, hearing impaired student and visual impaired student, the technique will be totally different. So we try to make a platform to allow all the participants join us without doing anything. They just only and the non-science teacher, when we talk about STEM, always think about the science teachers, uh, engineering students, and teachers from that one. But we also invite a lot of the us teachers to work together. So based on this, we find very important, maybe we can go to another slide. So based on this one, uh, our, our students become the mentors. Now what they think at the beginning, at the beginning they mentioned that uh, I am a university student. I am uh, very good in technology, very good in the English, very good in the other way. Come, and so for those uh, underprivileged special education needs, or I think I am coming to help you. But however, when they, after they join the program, they see another phase. For those are uh, SEN, underprivileged, and also the other, other students, when they are young, and then what they are doing that, they try to have a very important part, they never give up. Because that in general, uh, they may not have the opportunity to play the robotics. And due to a lot of the resources from the from the school, maybe there are a lot of resources that school maybe pick up the talent student only. But in here, we embrace with the, with the inclusion. So when they come to, to our student, the impact is a really, very really, really big. Every student in our course, they at the beginning, they think that I am coming to help the needies. But at the end, when we do the reflection, they say in other words, the needy helps them. And uh, sorry for that, every time I talk about this one, I. I am become this, and and why they think that they find those kids uh, never give up, always uh, under the very uh, not good situation, but they always have to try to solve the problem all the time. So they find out this is a part that we think about their university life. When they try to take a course, they think a course is too difficult, or that I drop it out. 
uh, when something is said, uh, maybe I put it down some way, but the times, the student, the participant affected too much. Finally, they change their learning attitude. And, and some of them, when they graduate, what they do, they go to the company and work and for a while, they join their CSR team and also to continue to provide the service. At the same time, some of them also become the pioneers to organize a lot of activities for all the special educationists under the page and also try to mingle. But we put everything together that no matter which school they are using all together from that one. So this is what we think that uh, and diversity and inclusion is very important. Let them to work together and even from high school students, they can work together from the team with, uh, with uh, participants, with the different mixed team together to work. So, so we really would like to continue to promote these activities. Even to this year will be the COVID-19. We always think outside the box. Maybe one, and we have already developed something that uh, everyone sitting in their room, at their home, with, it allows that you have the keyboard. You can control, remotely control our underwater robot in the real world. So we, we, we work right now working with the student and we would like to let the more people to get experience because we really would like to connect happy people together, especially no one will be left out. This is a, this is a message and also this is a way that we really want to teach our students. Great, Tim. What an amazing story about how I, I was thinking about high impact practices and you have created a very high impact practice for your students. With Thank you. If you're interested, I, I, will, I will ask you to join us to, to play the robot and build the robot. It's also great. Okay, Everyone can to. join us. Yeah. I would love to. We'll, we'll talk about that. <laughs> great. Uh, let's see, Tamara. Yes, I, I, think, I think I have a slide. So, um, yes, so I alluded to this, I think, in question one. So the benefits that my students are seeing, and, and maybe it'll help if I give a little bit of some background. Traditionally at UBC Okanagan, um, we had two cohorts of first year chemistry students. The 111, 113 were missing their grade 12, or their students who had been out of chemistry courses for like six years. So they, they're coming in with sort of a lack of knowledge or fresh knowledge, you could say. And then we had our 121, 123 students. So in the first graph, what you can see is we've separated the two groups by cohorts. And the 111, 113 students were traditionally the students that ended up going into our non-majors programs. Um, and then they kind of hit a dead end if they decided to change their mind about their chemistry courses because they had taken, you know, sort of the, um, the lower level of the two courses. So what this data is showing you in the first graph is that we're looking at the two cohorts separately. They've now put in, been put together into a single lecture hall. So they take the same exams, they work through the same activities, they are assessed in exactly the same way, um, except for a one hour tutorial that the, the, the 111, 113 streams gets. And what we've seen in the last few years when we've started implementing these active learning activities and these group assessments and um, the, the, global, the globalization of our course and the framework and, and sort of restructuring structuring our entire course. Um, those 111 students, we are bringing them up. We are bringing them closer in their, in their averages to those of the students that come in with grade 12. So we're, we're lessening the gap between the two, the two cohorts. In the second graph, what you can see is the completion rate of our students. So not only are their grades getting closer together, but overall my cohort of students are performing better and being more successful going from first year into second year. So we're not failing out as many students. They're, they're learning the material, they're grasping the material, and we've gone from a 64% uh, completion rate up to 80%. So we're reducing the, the withdrawals and the fails, and we're bringing all of our students up um, and what we have ongoing now is some is some investigations into how these student cohorts are performing in their second year organic classes. And we don't have official results yet, but all of our initial initial investigations show that instead of being um, underprepared for the 111, 113 students, that they are actually becoming competitive with their 121, 123 cohorts in their second year courses. And additionally, what we've seen is that um, well, what we what we're happy about is that we're no longer channeling them into dead end decisions. If they decide after their first year 
that they want to they want to change their mind and redirect themselves into a chemistry majors they have the skills to do that and um, they're not already pigeonholed into a one direction um, uh, second year organic course so these are some really nice results that we've seen uh, with the active learning that we've been doing in our classroom great thank you uh, do you have specific lessons within that that you would hope to share I think my lessons might reflect back to, to where Bob was alluding. It's like the students are taking these ownerships and, and they're, they're approaching the course with a little bit more interest. I always joke with the beginning of my course and say, raise your hand if you're here because you love chemistry and they're all like, Bleh. <laughs> but I think by the end of the course, um, the number of students that come back and actually say like, I learned something new and I realized that chemistry is important outside of what I thought it was important for. I think just that, that little anecdotal piece is, is it's worth doing the engagement so that students can see something that they hadn't anticipated seeing. Great. Thank you. Oh, I muted myself. Yasuhiro, I think you have a slide as well for this question. Okay. <coughs> yes, thank you. Um, from this year's trial, um, I said I created kind of, uh, I wrote a textbook and I uh, try um, kind of uh, uh, online, on, uh, no, 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 on the, on the, on the research learning. So I asked the student, uh, observe, uh, growth of bacteria, yeah, uh, in the internet. And I asked the student create a very basic model, very easy model by using ARMS. I it said before common language, very easy to model. So students do uh, experiments uh, at, at home by using pen and paper and the dice. And they created models themselves and experiment uh, doing in, in, the, in the home. And uh, based on the result of the simulation by using dice and pen and paper, they programmed uh, the model into a PC and did a computation, computer simulation. And some students very good at mathematics can deprive, derive uh, equation. Uh, it's uh, describe the phenomenon. Uh, it's kind of a training. And next I ask the student, you can find out anything from nature or society. Please find out interesting phenomena and doing the same things. So everyone searching uh, interesting things in society and na nature, and they try to model by using the common language I use, I said before RMS. And someone uh, do experiment at home, someone doing simulations. And uh, finally, um, uh, most of all, most of students can obtain a mathematical, can do a math, can did, uh, could did a mathematical analysis and can describe by the mathematics. So uh, during this uh, work, kind of exciting and interesting. So we can share the knowledge uh, by using ARMS and we can uh, together, together uh, improve the model and we can discuss. So uh, student is not uh, just a student. It looks like a collaborator. I have many collaborators like. So we discussed each by using uh, uh, email or sometimes on Zoom or something and we improve the models and we obtain the result. So uh, I think this is a very good way to experience for students. This is a research, this is a scientific research. So I am very enjoyed and I hope uh, students also enjoyed. Thank you. I made some notes as all of you were talking because again, there's a number of similarities students showed ownership, they showed care, they cared about the real world, again, which we just heard in the go find something. And I think related to that, they become more like scientists. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and when more students 
are staying in a class because their grades are higher and they don't have a dead end path, then there's greater persistence. And again, students see themselves like scientists. So there's a feeling component, there's a grade component. The word I was thinking of too is the growth mindset with Carol Dweck's work around, you can do this. Yeah, yeah. And I think all of you described scenarios where you're giving students in STEM fields that are often perceived as very, very difficult and challenging, you're giving them an opportunity to succeed and that success leads to more success. Thank you. Great, great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Yasuhiro, the fourth question is for you. And again, the shorter version is here, what has inspired you, but here's the longer version, which is that this year in 2020, higher education as part of this global community, we have all experienced a lot of upheaval. Most relevant to our conversation today, and as part of this whole conversation of this APRU conference this week, looking at this abnormal new normal, are the ways that faculty needed to adapt to engage students in these new environments. So for our final question, and then there are some things in the Q&A that we'll come around to, but our final prepared question is I would love for you to provide one example of an activity or an experience you have had with your STEM teaching that has kept you and your students inspired this year. Uh, yes, um, I basically the same story. Um, first of all, I try to uh, find out yet another lecture style. So I wrote online text, but it's not just a textbook. Yeah, it's not completed uh, book. Uh, and students have to do work with the textbook. Yeah, so I didn't any answer in the book. So students have to explore something. And every, uh, every time uh, find out the um, correct answer by using the textbook. So uh, students have to uh, uh, consult me, yeah? Otherwise cannot proceed. So it's not just a textbook. So, um, so this kind of, I drive the student to uh, communicate much more uh, than before. So, uh, and the uh, interesting things, uh, they are kind of very strong motivation, motivated very strong. And I had many, many well-considered questions than before, than before starting online learning. Before online learning, I have many easy questions, but after uh, on, uh, this year, online learning, I have many deep considered questions I have. And I was very, very surprised that their high creativity, so they can uh, reinvent uh, cellular automata and fractals, and uh, uh, someone uh, has an uh, volatile equations, but they didn't know anything about that. They observe nature and the models and the simulation and the deprived by themselves. So uh, they are undergraduate student, but they, uh, their abilities undergraduate, uh, graduate stu school student like. So uh, this year I was really surprised that uh, each student uh, has very high abilities and uh, creativity. So I want to expand their creativity more uh, by using this uh, online distance learning environment. Thank you. Thank you. What a surprising benefit that both you and your students experience by just this necessity of trying to figure out how to give students the content and writing the online textbook. Great, yeah. thank you, thank you. Bob, do you wanna tell us about your experience? And I know that yeah. you were on sabbatical in the spring, but 2020 is still going. Yeah, what's been going on in 2020? Um, so yeah, I, I'd say um, like, right, I missed the, the big unplanned switch to online instruction in the spring, but um, I've certainly been experiencing that this fall. And, and um, to be frank, I, I came into the, the semester with, with some apprehension. There's some unique challenges to online instruction that um, at least I don't feel like I've found great ways to overcome yet. Um, there's so much going on in the world. Uh, I was sort of worried about um, how engaged the students would be. And, and here I'm specifically thinking about this, um, 
this graduate seminar where we're, we're training graduate students in how to teach using active learning approaches. Um, and I've been uh, surprised and really happy with, with how it's gone. Um, I, re I remember specifically having a conversation with um, my, my teaching partner in this class before we started, um, of like how this was all going to go. We're, we're going to have a big group of people that um, largely don't know one another, all on Zoom, talking about some topics that um, occasionally can be sort of difficult to talk about. Um, and, and, you know, there's just always this wonder, will students really um, find the interest in it right now, given all of the, you know, very reasonable distractions they have in their lives. Um, and it's been, it's been heartening to see how they've approached it. Um, in a, so, so we've seen more engagement in these kinds of approaches to teaching than, than I, I would say in an average year when we do this. Um, frankly, part of it's been driven by the, you know, the protests in, in the US and renewed emphasis on, on issues related to diversity and equity. Um, so a lot of students sort of arrived on campus primed and ready to have these discussions and look for ways to um, make our, our learning more inclusive, um, which is just hugely important in a place like Hawaii, where we are drawing students from, um, you know, all across the Pacific. So. Great. Thank you, Bob. Let's see, Tim. Tim, where have you found inspiration? Yeah, and so, so COVID-19 has become the new normal to us. Uh, um, when we, at the beginnings, we think that uh, this is some maybe Maybe thought that this is maybe related to medical, medical medicine and doctor and something, but later on, and um, this is also a fact about learning, business and also even psychology and also we find that stay from home for a long time. So, so when I, when recently when I talked to my student that, uh, COVID nineteen is a is a give us a new opportunity to facing the new normal, even that maybe in the future so when the and when the pandemics will, will one day will go down. But the learning method and also the, the collaboration with different expertise will be totally different. So, and this is the things that what we are um, discussing recently with my student. But then one thing that maybe I can do the next night. Uh, one thing that uh, when we, at the beginning, when we talk about this, our student, and I remember in the February, in the one night about 9 p.m., and my, and my senior student, I think senior is talking about year three and year four student, you undergraduate. They give me a call to say that they are. They would like to discuss with me how can we, uh, as an engineer, to build some robots to help the uh, help help the people to because of social distancing, because of a lot of wires from that one. They discuss a lot, and then we spend about three hours to discuss everything, every possible, every possible any ideas. So even that they are they are not only describe the idea, they also give us a solution. They say that which device can be used and how can we apply the knowledge from the other thing. So finally, I, I, I may think that they really work together. And, then, and I promise that I try to contact some doctors to see for their, own, their you know, opinions and to see how can we improve this one. Later on, we see a lot of robots, even not put by us, a lot of robots around the world, they're also doing a similar way. So, so this is a part is a very important because that, but for those are first year students and second year students, they just only the first time to join the robotics. At February, they asked me a question that, uh, we don't know, we don't do not have um, a, a, a crystal ball. The competition may be go on or may not be go on, may be canceled, may be postponed. Is it worth for us to, to still continue to build the robot? Because still don't think that making the robot for competition is their own goal. So at that time, I talked to them for every time and university make the announcement that we have some arrangement about online learning some arrangement about uh, uh, social distancing, some arrangement about uh, 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 how many number of people can be sit together. And as long as every time the university make the announcement, I, I think that about uh, for every week they have one announcement there. And my, I and my student call a meeting all the time, discuss what do we want to do. Finally, the message we carry out is that we become unstoppable. No matter, go back to, I, we ask them a very, very, then core values for question. Why did why did they join the robotics team? Because of competition or because you really want to change yourself? Because you really want to work together with other people? Finally, the other answer is say that they really want to work with people, prepare for the future. Then I say that then no matter whether the competitions go on or go off, 
or maybe online, maybe postponed. This doesn't matter. It never stops us to build a robot. Finally, after the three meetings, and later on, from March to, to the, just like the recently, we have a lot of ideas to, to help change our, all the training chef job for the new batch of students to online. They work to our, our senior members, our, and they go through the whole process. They finally build their robot. No matter, so, and they also, they say that one thing very important that uh, I amazing that they, they try to arrange the time slot for the 24 hours full day. Uh, and, and because that they want to have a social distancing to minimize the number of people, but they would like to work together. So it's fit in the circle group and then sometimes to make together. Finally, um, the message is, uh, I, I tell you that if, uh, if the company tell us that the, the, all the competition resume at this moment, I, I can tell you that I have very proud of them to say that they are ready to join. So, so this is uh, what an amazing story I, I really would like to share now. Uh, if you are interested from that one, and uh, um, we have, if you go to YouTube, if you find the name We Are Unstoppable, they make a video to tell you what they think and what their ideas during this period. Yeah, this is uh, what I say. I really, really appreciate, really, very powerful time to be, to be worth it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. I, I love in that story how it started with just a small conversation with a student and it's clear how much they've inspired each other and they've inspired you too. And now they've inspired us as well. Thank you. Thank you. Tamara. Yes. I'm sorry you have to follow that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, as the question, um, providing an example of, a, of an activity or an experience. So what I thought I would show to the, um, the panel here today is uh, one of our active learning or case study examples. Uh, this one specifically focuses on the ozone layer and the idea of refrigerants. And what I, what I think speaks volumes about these activities is there's no new material being presented in this. So our case studies are, are written in a way where the students come to class, it's all review. So it's basically exam prep in a way that isn't just answer this question, answer this question, see if you can get the right answer, but it's bringing in those global issues. It's bringing in those ideas of the UN sustainability. They're doing their review questions. They're applying it to real concepts. Um, by the end of this activity, we have this idea molecules can be both helpful and harmful. So the idea that refrigeration gases were developed in one way, we noticed that they were making holes in the ozone layer, so we changed the molecule and now we can do this, but now they have global warming potential. And beyond the global warming, one second, I'm sorry. It is bedtime. Yes, it's bedtime. Let me close the door. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, Thank you to your little one for joining us. <laughs> hey, grab a book, Lucas. It's okay, honey bunny. I want a monster that says boo. Yep, grab, grab a book, the monster that says boo. Daddy has that one on the couch, honey. Okay, go grab it. Thank you. All right, she'll be right back when she gets the book for her little I'm one. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, you're okay. You're okay. It is bedtime here at NBC. <laughs> um, I, I guess where I was, I just wanted to say that we show them the iterative process of science in these activities. It's only review. And, and I think, again, anecdotally, what I really enjoy about these activities and what's really inspiring for everyone is that what I used to notice before an exam was that I'd have 20% of my class in attendance. But in this case, the entire class shows up they show up they they're chatting with their neighbors they're doing work that doesn't feel like exam prep they're learning something about the environment or about policies or about um about the world around them and and it's just really inspiring again to, to have those conversations with the students i get my entire fitbit workout during one of these active learning classes as i'm running around my classroom in the online environment, we haven't reached this this set in the course yet, but I'm anticipating that my chat function is just is just going to be off the rails compared to what I'm really used to in a normal conversation or a normal review session with students. So I am looking forward to it. I'm excited about presenting this material to my students when we get to this part of the course. So 
that is where I will leave it in terms of my, my active learning example. Great, thank you, thank you. And I want to acknowledge that part of the inclusivity that we're also facing is that we're working at home and our environments are different and our students are facing that and we're all facing that too. And so that, that grace that we can give each other as we're being inspired by each other, I think is really, it's one of the lessons that I certainly have learned and that I, I heard in your, in your descriptions as well. We have a little bit of time for some questions and there are some that have come into the Q&A. So the, the first question that I have here that I'm going to ask is, how have your institutions, and this is open to anyone, how have your institutions managed the STEM subjects, and many of us teach subjects with labs, or experimentation when being face-to-face -face has been discouraged or not allowed at all on our campuses. So how have you dealt with the lab experience for students? Open to anyone. Go ahead. So uh, um, I'm actually the coordinator for our first year chemistry program for the laboratories inclusive with the, with the lectures. And I had a, a lot of conversations with uh, my colleagues and I think the big decision we made for the first year program was we recognized that they're not going to get the tangible skills of manipulating the equipment. So what we refocused was on transferable skills. So we're, we're spending more time rather than just expecting a formal lab report is we've partnered with the library and we're teaching them how to, to search for their citations. We're teaching them um, proper citation techniques. We're taking them through step-by-step -step guidance into their formal reports. Why do we have an abstract? What's important about that? Things that we sort of pushed under the rugs because we were so focused on teaching them um, burette skills and, and, and pipette skills. Um, we now get to redirect our focus. And I've really approached the redesign for the online environment for the, my first year students um, with the intention that we're gonna keep at least 50% of the material that we've developed because it will be beneficial to them no matter what. Teaching them how to use an Excel file for data manipulation and, and, um, and graphing. Like first year students in chemistry have no idea how to graph. So we're taking the time, we're taking the step back we're teaching them those skills and really placing into the learning objectives of our laboratory that it's not just about touching the equipment and getting the data but what does the data mean and what can you do to help present your data to the world that makes more sense so Great. thank you no I, have a, I have a follow-up question for you is how big is your active learning class the classroom that you showed us so my my when we're face to face in person yeah we have a 400 person class and currently I'm teaching all 700 plus of them in a single Zoom lecture. Okay. Okay, and if I'm remembering correctly, does the, the main campus of UBC in Vancouver, is there a, a, there's an even larger active learning lecture hall, is that true? Um, I think they have an active learning lecture hall that's comparable in size, okay. so I'm not, but they have a student cohort, so I can teach it in two sections, my, my cohort, they have a student cohort of about 2000 students. So I'm not sure how many lecture sections they teach in their learning classrooms. Okay, okay. But, um, and part of the, the question that's here is, is there a difficult number? I know that my colleagues at the University of Washington are, are teaching 700, 600 to 700 students in an active learning classroom. And they're still able to meet their learning goals. And part of that is that it, you have to get students bought in to that they're, they're in it with each other. They're, they're, their, um, what was the word you used? Ownership and care. Those were the words we heard earlier. I guess I could put in that I don't run my active learning by myself. I have, I have at least two TAs that also run around the classroom and help and help mitigate questions and help direct students. So it is, it is definitely a team situation in a room that big. Great. Thank you so much. Tim, you wanted, wanted to share also some suggestions about lab experimentation and what you have been yeah, able to uh, okay, thank, thank you. you. So in electronics engineering, this is a lot of laboratory experiments. So what uh, my colleagues uh, also do is uh, we most likely we turn all the all the laboratory experiment face to face to be online one. So allow the student to do it online because nowadays this is a lot of the software. 
and also some simulation tools is available on the on the on the website. So if we can find out something to appropriate and then we design our lab sheet, then this one can be feasible. For my courses, on my courses, because we need the student to do and some hands-on experience to try to build something together. So what we do is we just uh, uh, and we just only and uh, borrow the, the allow the student to bring the equipment back to the home. And I think that the equipment may not be too big. Just are eight four papers in size in 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 the, you know, put in the eight four boxes, so so they bring it to home and do everything. And some uh, I, one of the workshop I train is to be online, let them to get a taste. And finally, we find that uh, um, but some of them just like the robotics. If uh, this is a the traditional course I teach, so if the robotics one the student when they come back, so we try to uh, make sure that the the uh, the uh, occupancy less than fifty percent or less. So we scale the student in several different group, and then they uh, they try to uh, for every time just only a small group to work together. But one thing's very important that we tell the student that no matter whether you are doing a good project or individual one, so uh, all the things safety and health is should be do. They have to wear the mask, they wash the hands, they have to to record all the temperatures. So because uh, because of this uh, message, I that we tell the student that we are not saying that we are not allow you to come back, but if you come back together uh, with your safety because uh, and also with the good habits to protect the other people you are welcome to come to my lab and so so this is uh, i will tell you this is not our policy to tell you what you want to do it's the point is that how you contribute to make the room to be safety if the room become unsafety then all the lab will be closed then finally you cannot complain anything because we are work together to make uh, everything to be feasible. So this is uh, the message I always work with the student to tell them we are the partners, we are the team. We have to work together to facing COVID-19. So this is uh, what we allow them to come back to work in a small growing size. Great, so it's kind of the examples here of moving it all online and thinking about the skills, the science process skills, or creating an environment and a community where students want to come back and they know that they're responsible for that. Great, thank you. The next question is on the subjects related with lots of calculating, such as principles of unit operation might be an example. How could teachers improve active learning for students with very kind of technical topics like that? Or how have you? Uh, I could maybe take, I could maybe take a crack at that. Um, so I, I could maybe tell a story um, of of kind of not doing a great job of that, which is going on right now. So um, I'm I'm currently teaching an online workshop um, to a group of about 20 students scattered uh, across North America, Europe, and um, Africa, and it's the the topic of this workshop is um, it's graduate level instruction on. Um, on phylogenomics, if, if anyone knows that field, but it's um, lots of probability theory, lots of statistics, lots of computer coding, and you kind of have to fit it all together for it to make, to, for it to sort of work. Um, so it's very technical, um, tends to be pretty challenging for students. So this is our first workshop we've been doing online. And um, when we approached the design of it, we were thinking, well, um, we have a limited amount of time in person with one another on Zoom. And then the students will have much more time um, to work through examples and communicate with one another through just sort of chat. Um, we're, we're using the software program Slack, if people are familiar with that. Um, so we basically designed this big workshop where we were giving them sort of the, the theory, which is very hard in my experience for students to pick up on their own, and then trying to leave them um, to be a little more independent on the actual implementation. So trying to get them to do peer peer learning and working together on it. And um, so we're in like day six of this workshop right now. And I, just this morning we were talking about it um, and deciding like this, this hasn't worked that great. They're um, sort of like Tamara was saying earlier, the, um, the, the little sort of technical skills that the students need that um, they bump into these little, basically computer bugs in many cases. And in a normal workshop, we're sort of there in the room we're walking around and we can sort of solve those and keep them going um so what we've basically decided is for future iterations of this workshop we need to 
do it as, as a completely flipped workshop. We'll record the lectures, give them the theory on that, and then bring everyone um, together and work through all of these examples sort of step by step together and, and really deal with like solving computer bugs in a, a big group scattered across several continents. So really some more structure is what I heard in that. And that, that's my experience in teaching concept uh, complex biology topics as well is that I need to give the students the they need that that framework for it they need a cognitive framework or it just feels like a pile a wood pile and they don't know how to make any sense of it absolutely uh, Yasuhiro you also teach kind of complex mathematical thinking do you have any other any other thoughts about how you do this in an active learning environment uh, yes um as you, uh, uh, I read your comment and I agree with and how to evaluate uh, and how to uh, give uh, kind of uh, rate. So I, I'm now I thinking I want to start kind of uh, academic, academic meeting like style. So student do research and submit and I will reject by comment. So student improve the result. So uh, finally, I accept, uh, if I accept, accept uh, the research kind of a hybrid, but not, not, uh, not accepted kind of fail the course. So uh, people do themselves, improve themselves and, uh, and try to explore uh, their kind of uh, universe of uh, knowledge. So uh, I would like to uh, teach uh, not just knowledge. Uh, complexity science is kind of um, uh, activities, yeah. Not just result, yeah. Activity itself is complexity, is kind of hurt. So I would like to uh, give uh, the student how to behave as a science scientist in complexity, city complex cities. So uh, now I plan to uh, create a kind of fake academic meeting, so everyone submit papers, and I, I reviewed and uh, back, something like. Great, so it's building relevance into why should you know, and if we're thinking about unit operation, how can you use that in a, yeah. in a real example so that yeah. students see the relevance? Great, yes. great, thank you. Here's a, a bigger picture question. We have a couple more questions that are very different from each other. So we're going to go in a couple of different places. The first question is this big picture one. Given the current situation with the pandemic, what are your perspectives on creating joint online learning programs, especially in STEM fields? Tim, and, and yes, let, let me say it this way. Uh, I think that this is a very interesting topic. I think um, this is also can be explored, how can we do this one? And I, I, I recently, I received the invitations from the APRU that asked whether we can offer some online workshop or virtual workshop for the student and for the students. So I, I received this one. So when I can bring this message to my team, and because I always think that uh, if I decide something, I may not listen to what they want to do, but I would like to listen to them first. So when I talk to them, and then they say that they, they come a new idea. The idea is uh, we plan to offer two workshop, online workshop to teach all of you, all of your students about AI, I'm sorry, machine learning. So using some simple tools and they can play about two hours and then we will work from the something that will let you to experience about the, 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 um, and the beautiful of the machine learning. And regardless of uh, which discipline you are, uh, we are because we really would like to do something for all. And then, and then, and, and also, then they second in the second half, maybe half an hour and one hour, they will share uh, uh, the experience in building the robots. So, so I think that uh, we we are looking forward to see over some. I, I'm not. No, I don't know how about the course is a is a very long lasting for for one semester for one semester, but I think that uh, 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 we are we are trying to um, um, offer some kind of workshop. To interact with the, in, I think they're very important to let our students to interact with the other student. So that's why they would like to and um, do some online uh, machine learning workshop 
so do some recognition and something so they are deciding right now so uh, hopefully this is will be ready around the november or, or late november or, or or around the mid november so i'm still talking with my student but i, I really love to try and explore uh, regardless uh, uh, whether it's success or not and uh, one message we always tell our student that we try to embrace failure because if you can turn failures to become experienced then you will become an experienced people so so uh, so we we our students are working on that one hopefully this will be ready really ready uh, in, in the mid of october for the other thing i think it is open i really happy to discuss to explore with uh, with you to to try to see how can we work together i think we heard another example with bob talking about doing a, another workshop across continents and you have very different disciplinary areas so i think there's probably a lot of possibilities and knowing who to connect with it might be the the challenge to start uh, I'm going to shift gears. I think there's a, I think this depends on how long our answers are. This might be our last question, but this is a question about, about assessment. And the main challenge that this person is facing is that convincing the university and convincing accreditation that things such as peer group and self learning assessment can be legitimate assessment tools for meeting learning outcomes and for and for meeting it's different than conventional ach achievement and individual grades and individual ranking and how do we how have you thought about assessments how have you thought about new modes of assessment that might actually make more sense in the context that we're teaching in right now but are very different from what we're traditionally used to who wants to tackle an assessment question I, I go for it. Um, it's a hard question because it sounds like what the question is asking is how do I convince, how do I convince those that are in the powers that be that these are legitimate assessment practices? And I guess my, con my, my concern there is, that, or I, I'm sorry that you have to convince them because I feel like there's enough literature out there and there's enough evidence out there that these are acceptable. These are, in many ways, they allow students to assess their own learning. So it moves their desire away if they, if they are being judged by their peers. We do two stage exams in my first year chemistry class. So they study harder because they know describe they have to- two stage exams. I'm going to have a describe two stage exams. Oh, sure. Yeah. My students come into their assessments. Oh, my internet says it's unstable. I hope you can hear me. A 45 minute individual exam. Then they turn around and they group with their with pre assigned groups and they discuss almost the same exam um, as a part two, but they have to come to group consensus. And the feedback we get from our students in that is that they study harder because they don't want to be the dumb student in the group. Um, they want to be able to contribute because there's peer assessment to that. So this peer evaluation process actually puts more ownership on the students. They feel more responsible for their learning. Um, and that assessment piece can take them further rather than I just need to get the A to get through the course. Like they come in with a mentality that they know how to teach it to each other they they walk away with more conceptual concrete understanding rather than just the memorization piece so it's hard to have to convince someone when there's a lot of really good evidence out there that shows that these are legitimate assessment techniques the peer evaluation and the conversations and the discussion pieces so yeah <laughs> that's Great. I see some smiles. I, I hope <laughs> that was helpful. Well, I, I think Bob talked earlier about reading the literature and sometimes using the literature to our advantage can can further the conversations. Would anyone else like to add to anything that you're thinking about with assessment and how you're doing it online? Tim? Yeah, 
So, so for the assessment, I, I use a peer learning uh, uh, for a long time. So even right now, uh, when we do the, because in my, in my course, uh, we have a peer learning and peer elevations, and also we have uh, a traditional examination from that one. So this is a combination together from this. So and uh, meanwhile, when we, how can we make the peer elevations to be more fairness? Then we, and we sometimes we will try to find out some cases because that our, as, a, as a professors and also the TA, we sometimes we have some individual focus group of them. So we try to understand what happens to the group. So, um, but I think it is a really challenging set that uh, if you say that the traditional way is, uh, is, uh, is uh, one way we can measure, but I think that this is not the only way. So, um, because a different, uh, like, like the hybrid mode, uh, we will not say that um, peer elevation is the best way and the traditional way, the another, another best, but sometimes they have to mix. So, uh, and, and the point is how can we, from the student point of view, they are more concerned or maybe for more from us more concerned whether this is a kind of the fairness and also can really really uh, reflect the student learning so i think that sometimes if we really want to use the peer assessment and sometimes maybe introduce something my, my experience that sometimes you introduce some kinds of a focus group discussion uh let the student voice out and one message we tell the student that when you do a peer elevations we are not doing at the end of the course. Meanwhile, you can also do the peer evaluation. If you find there's something abnormal about your teammates and some part, so try to voice out at the beginning. So we will step in and help them to understand this challenge and try to help them to, to do maybe some one student maybe and take the take very hard in dominate all the world. So the other student when they we, we because when we tell the student that you are welcome to talk to us anytime. Our case is that some students find one is a dominator, then the, the other one will try to tell us that uh, someone dominate his work and he cannot uh, contribute anything. Then we will sit down together to see what happens. Because uh, there are two extreme cases. One is the people really want to dominate. The others maybe want to dominate, but they want to do, but this one will not never allow him to do. The other way around, this one would like to do the work, but this is another free wider in here. So, so the, we and in our experience that about in over the years, about five percent of students will be fall in this kind of of the challenge. So we we just only check with them to try to figure out the solution. I think and and not do all the assessment at the end of the course. Uh, but the point is, as long as we can help in the middle, then then this one will help them. Just like we have some kind of the. Uh, interim presentation, interim discussions, uh, and we have just like why why do we have the continuous assessment? We have a midterm final exam because we really would like to have some points to add a checkpoint to see how the progress of the student and also let us know how our progress for the teaching. So so I think this is uh if we follow the same idea, then then we can do the things better. Great. Great, thank you. I love this idea of not, we're not gonna save all the assessment to the end. We're gonna measure it throughout. I know that we're leaving some questions hanging, but we are at almost half past the hour. And I wonder if Elaine could put up the slides again. The, we would like to invite you to continue having conversations about teaching as part of the APRU network. We are launching what is this, a second part in a series of teaching in virtual environments conversations. And uh, that one of the questions that we're leaving hanging is about technology and what do you do with students who have low internet connectivity? And I've just today confirmed that a colleague who teaches at the University of Philippines in Manila is going to join us for one of these conversations. We also have a colleague from Melbourne who uses a lot of different interesting technology. So we'll, we'll send more of information out and invite all of you. These are interactive conversations that we would love to have everyone join. I want to say a, a big thank you to our panelists today for coming and sharing your wisdom and your experience. I asked the question about being inspired with your students and you have left me inspired. So thank you very much for sharing your time with us today.
So thank you very much to our panelists, Tamara, Yoshihiro, Bob and Tim for the sharing and also our wonderful moderator, Ali. So a big thank you again. And thank you also for joining this webinar. We hope you enjoyed it and we look forward to meeting you again in the future events. And we will share with you the video recording of this webinar later. So everybody stay safe and stay healthy. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.